Uh, hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR leaders. Uh, today's guest is Chris Roebuck. Hopefully I've got that right, Chris. <laughs> uh, Chris is an expert in optimizing organizational performance by the transformation of culture, leadership, talent, and people. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, Chris, fill in the gaps. Tell um, our listeners a little bit more about yourself and uh, your journey in the world of HR. Well, I, I don't necessarily view myself as a, an HR person. I sort of view myself more as a, an organizational people type person. And, and the journey from the recruitment search consultancy perspective is one similar to a drunken spider. Um, uh, started off uh, as an economist, trained to be an accountant, got bored with being an accountant, so ended up going into the British Army, which taught me quite a lot about leadership, about people and how they work under pressure. Came out uh, from that, went in, worked with SMEs, which was interesting, and that taught me a lot about the entrepreneurial spirit within SMEs and how SMEs function and the challenges they have then MBA into the bigger business world, into initially London Underground, interesting public sector, public-private partnership, highly unionized, very, very uh, aggressive uh, union with the RMT, then into the financial services sector, HSBC, investment bank. Uh, one of the challenges there, again, is how do you motivate people in a, in a global organization? KPMG, helping them set up a business. Then over to UBS, global head of leadership. Interesting there. So flipping from public sector perspectives about what makes things work to hard commercial bottom line driven perspectives. Back to UK from uh, Switzerland into the National Health Service. Again, public sector, but this time rather than a smaller organization, a massive service made up of over 300 separate trusts and how do you consolidate that into a consistent way of getting the best from people and then uh, after that working a little bit in local government advising banks and, and generally working with organizations uh, around the world that realize that success is delivered through people and they want to make that happen mm -hmm. Fantastic. Very interesting journey. <laughs> and it's fantastic. You've got those multiple perspectives from you know, the public, the private, you know, the army and all of the different perspectives and cultures, I suppose, that you've been exposed to um, along that. So where we are now, really, what occupies your mind on a day to day basis? What, what are some of the work you're doing at the moment? Well, the, the thing that that journey taught me was that everybody thinks that leadership and the way you deal with people and this is all sector specific or industry specific and what happens in the army is different to what happens in the commercial sector and that journey has taught me that the abiding lesson is actually it's not that they're different it's actually that the commonalities of how you get the best from people irrespective of what you're doing as an organization are greater than the differences you know, I, I often use a quote that says, uh, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work and say to people, you know, who do you think said that? It must be someone who's really clued in to employee engagement in the modern world and all the rest of it. Actually, it was Aristotle two and a half thousand BC, sorry, two and a half thousand years ago. So from that perspective, what people in our organizations want in their lives, in their work, and how to get the best out of them is totally consistent, irrespective of culture. And I think that's, that's where I'm now currently engaged. And one of the other things I find fascinating is that the complexity of modern organizations now means that people are focused fundamentally on getting the day-to-day -day job done and out the way because that's how they're managed in terms of their uh, performance management. The problem is because that complexity and creation of silos has built up, many people are now missing the big picture. And to some degree, not only senior leaders, but also the HR profession has lost touch to a little bit uh, of the sort of the core things that people need to be able to do to do their jobs properly. And we're focusing in the HR world about the really interesting and important 
stuff around talent management, around leadership, around metrics, around performance management, etc., which have to be there. But we're forgetting some of the basics that we need to have to underpin success in making those work. Fantastic. And could you share, um, and when, we, when we last spoke as well, you mentioned some of the, the recent conversations you've been having around the different project deliveries of HR and the success yeah. that we're currently seeing. Could you share some of that? Well, well the, the interesting thing is that everybody's doing what they need to do and they're saying, oh yeah, we're doing this, we're doing this, that's great, we got that done and that initiative done and this initiative done, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, tick in the box. One of the things I've been doing for a few years is any group of leaders I work with anywhere in the world, I just pose this simple question. If you look back at your entire career at all the initiatives that you've seen launched on anything, risk, customer focus, cost efficiency, talent, anything, and you put your hand on your heart and you say, what percentage of these initiatives got anywhere vaguely near being fully and successfully implemented to deliver the benefits that were initially anticipated? And my line is, I'm going to start at 100%. And I'm going to go down in 10% bands and you just simply stick your hand up when we get to the percentage that you think met the criteria of being anywhere near fully and successfully implemented. And I started doing this and I was horrified by the initial answers. But consistently, over a two-year period, every audience I have spoken to has pretty much come down at 20 and 30% as a sort of equal split that data that data point is actually supported by studies from a, a number of other sources now if we just take a step back and think about what we're saying there so you're saying 20 percent have delivered effectively right correct that's yeah. the key point <laughs> so if you flip that round what that means is that most people from their own experience see somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all the initiatives that are being launched not working properly now even if they're 10 percent out even if they're 20 percent out it's still a horrendous figure of failed implementation i just pose the question to hr directors and to ceos look you know, you're all very very busy throwing these initiatives into the system strategy initiatives HR initiatives around whatever you want. The problem is that if you have a system where there's only a 20 to 30% chance of that initiative reaching its full potential, should you not be saying to yourself, hang on, we need to ask ourselves the question, why are these figures so low and what can we do about it? Because fundamentally for the HR department, if those figures are that low, you need to get them up so that the projects you're trying to implement are likely to get traction. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? Uh, a lot of the members I speak to talk about going back to the board, getting sign off for projects is one of the biggest challenges. But from what you're telling me, it's going to be pretty difficult if 80% of your projects aren't uh, delivering results and then you're going back asking for more funding uh, for, for the next one. So what is, what is your, um, obviously you've had these conversations. What yeah. are your, how, how do we solve this? Well, the, the, thing, the thing that's really, really interesting is if you take ballpark, if you take the average sort of engagement figures that organizations are getting now, Back, and then back in 2000. If you take the improvements in bottom line from now to 2000, all of those figures show a consistent picture that engagement scores haven't really moved that much. You know, there hasn't been a massive improvement in the effectiveness of organizations. And I've just posed the question, looking at my career and what I saw going right and going wrong and talking to people around the world, the critical issue, I think, is something that actually falls totally within the gambit of HR to do something about. I think the issue is if we make the assumption that the strategic leaders that we work with do come up with good strategies, which is not always correct, but we'll make that assumption, <laughs> yep. then underneath them are the leaders that are their direct reports and, and the next level below and underneath them are the people who have to do the job 
at its most basic, the people between the strategic leaders and the people who have to do the job have to translate those strategic ideas into inspiring operational plans that the people who do the doing want to genuinely do. Mm -hmm. I call them translational leaders, translating strategy into inspiring plans. Now, the issue from my perspective boils down to the fact that that particular group has neither the skills, motivation, nor understanding to deliver the potential that all of those initiatives have. And that's where we have the challenge. Now, what do I mean by that? Skills. If you look at the data from SHRM, CIPD, CMI, or any other, other group of people about the level of basic management skills training in commercial organizations, it is dire. We are talking, for example, maybe only 25 to 30 percent of people who have been given any training in delegation. If we work on the basis that any line manager should be able to A, prioritize, B, manage time, C, delegate, D, communicate, E, give feedback. If those core skills are not in place, those line managers are fundamentally going to be unable to do what they are being asked to do effectively. Now, I just thought, now, this is nuts. It, it can't be down at 25 to 30 percent for delegation. <laughs> yeah. So in my normal practical way, I had a group of leaders and I now do this again with every group of leaders and say, just out of interest, everybody in the room, how many of you have had any formal training in delegation in your career? And I'm not joking. It comes out at roughly 30 percent every time. What we're saying then and I'm sorry for laughing because it's actually no, quite, it does it, sound it, pretty it's crazy. frightening. Yeah. We have potentially 70% of line managers who are supposed to be doing delegation on a day-to-day -day basis who've not been told how to do it properly and are making it up as they go along. Is it therefore any wonder that that part of the equation is not working? Then if we take the motivation element I mentioned, effectively, your boss has the same issue. They can't delegate, prioritize, manage time, or potentially give you so good it's an, feedback. It's a knock-on effect all the way down the business. So your boss isn't motivating you, so you're not inspired about what they're saying to you because they're firefighting on a daily basis like you are. Because the issue is if you're firefighting and you're not doing those core things, you're not genuinely in control of events. If you're not in control of events, you then don't have the bandwidth or the confidence to add inspirational leadership on top. And then the understanding is the big picture. How does what I do add to what the organization needs to do? The evidence would suggest that 25% potentially of stuff that's being done at operational level actually adds no value whatsoever to strategic objectives. It's just stuff that people do because they don't see the connection because no one's told them the connection between the big picture and what they do. The other thing is that is bizarre is that if you look at the statistics, telling people how what they do fits into the big picture and what the big picture is mm -hmm. can get over 30% extra effort from them. Of course, the sense of purpose. Correct. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a total no brainer that if you don't tell them, A, they don't know what they need to align to and B they're not motivated and then you say oh that's complicated Chris I'm sorry <laughs> telling the people on your team why they do yeah why they're doing what they how can that be complicated <laughs> it's it's and the point I'm trying to make is that in the rush to do all the strategic and complicated stuff we're losing sight of some of those basics that our people have to be given for them to be able to give their best and to want to give their best. Mm -hmm. If HR has any mission in an organization, it's not to deliver HR, it's to deliver success. And the only way you can do that is through two steps. One, everybody in that organization genuinely giving their best because they care about the organization. And secondly, that best being effectively focused on what is critical 
not wasted on stuff that isn't critical. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing really is, you know, chief executives say, yes, yes, but Chris, I'm an inspiring chief executive. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't matter because if your boss is an idiot and the chief executive is inspiring, who cares? Your boss is still an idiot. Yeah. He's the one you've got to deal with or she's the one you've got to deal with. One of the other things that uh, you might find interesting, another question I ask, which gives you the secret to success, and I think this is what HR departments and teams need to really think about, is I, for five years, have been asking leaders around the world, let's not talk about leadership models, let's just talk about the reality of your experience as an individual. Over your entire career, you'll have had great bosses and you'll have had not so great bosses. Obviously, you want to forget the not so great ones, so we'll forget the not so great ones. But think about the ones that were really, really inspirational that you gave everything for, that you went the extra mile for. And I have a simple exercise. I say to them, right, think of that individual compared to those that were not so great. Write down on a piece of paper what that person did day to day that made them so truly special, that inspired you and made you give your best. And I've been doing that for well over five years now. And one of the things I noticed was when I asked the audience what was on their list and I flip charted it, it started being the same things time after time after time. Mm -hmm. It's now got to the point where I have a slide that I put up. <laughs> predicting. I, no, 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 not predicting. <laughs> I let them produce their list. Yeah. And I say, that's your list of things that will deliver super performance. And let's give you some examples. One, treats me like a professional, treats me with respect, develops my career, understands I make genuine mistakes, listens to me, asks for my ideas, gives me feedback, builds trust and transparency. Mm -hmm. All of those most basic, simple things, tells me what's going on. All of those most basic things always come up on that list. When you look at the list, it's normally about 10, 12 things. When you analyze those things that always come up, what is really, really interesting is that all of those things cost an organization nothing to do more of. All of those things on that list do not require a course to do. All of those things on that list could be done more of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So the moral of the story, I think, for HR functions is, you know, whilst you're thinking about all this talent stuff and the strategy and blah, 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 never forget that underpinning the success of what you do are some consistent things that all leaders have to do for their people on a day-to-day -day basis that will get the best. When you analyze that list and you ask people to say, okay, of those things that made you give super performance, which of them relate just to the job? Which of them relate to the emotional relationship between you and that individual that inspired you and which are a bit of both? It is then really interesting. Out of the list, normally only one relates to the job. Roughly 80% normally relate to the emotional relationship between the mm -hmm. individual and their boss, and the rest are a little bit of both. So the moral of the story is, if we want our organizations to have super performance, it's not actually about telling people to do the job, it's about inspiring them to emotionally want to do the job. Mm -hmm. And that is really interesting because, you know, you'll say, Chris, okay, this list, you know, how do you know it's consistent? That exercise I have done with investment bankers in New York, NHS clinicians in UK, lawyers in London, HR directors in Chennai. I did it with HR directors in Vienna a couple of months ago, supply chain professionals. Um, I did it with the top 50 leaders of the Chinese space program in Beijing, engineers and scientists. Um, everybody you could imagine. 
from all sorts of industries over the last five years. And it is always the same list of things that makes human beings give super performance and care about what happens. And my view is that in HR, we will only get all of those things we know work strategically and add the greatest value to an organization to work if underpinning that we have people who are being inspired by their bosses to give their best because that's the only way those initiatives we are promoting will happen if you take a most basic example you know my experience at, at ubs take high potentials so we in hr spend a lot of time mm -hmm. working out how we can identify high potentials yep complicated this feedback from these people feedback from the assess blah 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 then we develop them in some way shape or form really expensive development program they meet the chairman chief executive and they're sent away thinking that they are the greatest thing in the history of this organization <laughs> they are mm -hmm. the future they have been told they are the future they are valued etc and then they're sent back to a line manager who because of what i've previously said does not have the skills or motivation to leverage the potential that that individual has and might not even care and might see them as a threat probably a threat <laughs> so what then happens is you have this hyped up high potential thinking that they're going to be given the opportunity to grow and develop who suddenly landed back with a line manager who either won't do it or can't do it and that's the point where the HR strategy the really good HR stuff that we are doing around talent and all of that sort of stuff bangs falls straight, flat basically falls flat <laughs> specifically because we have forgotten that the basics of management and leadership have to be in place as the foundation for success and the reason I mention that list is that and everybody says but Chris it's really really complicated to create that environment where those line managers will inspire people and will get the best from example high potentials that list shows that it's absolutely not that list of things shows absolutely that anybody that's worked in an organization for more than two or three years knows what they have to do but there's a, a disconnect between their understanding of this is what I've experienced and motivates me and what I need to give my people and HR's role in connecting those two is fundamental it's such a simple thing for HR to do that can literally from my experience of working with organizations it can set the organization afire in terms of a few enthusiasm mm -hmm. it makes people care the most simple analysis is if you go back to the basic psychology it's it's about this in your subconscious there are some switches that effectively say if somebody does something that I think is positive is showing that they care about me these subconscious switches mean that you will reciprocate mm -hmm. and you will be in a positive mind frame and you will in some way have a positive outcome have a positive <laughs> outcome with those individuals yeah so that's how that momentum builds up so it means that actually if a line manager does those simple things on the list it automatically produces a positive response in their team equally if they say something stupid yeah it will produce an immediate and subconsciously driven negative reaction so my point to organizations to, and to the HR function is getting the best out of people is about a that critical foundation of interaction between leaders and their people to make them want to give the best focusing that best on what the organization needs to do and then adding into that mix the excellent HR technical stuff around performance management around talent management around metrics that makes the system work the fundamental flaw is that if that foundation of that leadership positive leadership relationship between people and line managers is not present 
you can throw as much talent management and performance management into the mix as you like, but it will never produce the potential that it could if the foundation was in place. Fantastic. Very, very interesting. So I suppose the, the interesting question everyone's going to ask is what are the steps that you take? <laughs> what are the first, if you were a H, if you, if you, if you were a HR leader in this position and uh, I suppose it seems yeah. like quite a lot of them are right. What is the steps that you'd recommend that they would need to take to action this change in their business? I, I think it's about creating a, a clear business case for this. And I've said to HR directors, look, you know, in the final analysis, if we look at all the data around getting this right, you can pretty much say, if you get this right, you're going to get probably 10% on your bottom line. Now, but what's the investment? As I've just said, if you do these things, they cost nothing. So if the HR director says to the finance director and CEO, I'll tell you what, if you do these things I'm suggesting, we can probably get 10% on the bottom line for no cost. You know, if, if they don't, you know, do you think that's a good idea? Now, if they say no, it's time to resign because you're obviously working for a pair of idiots. Yeah. So, you know, where, where does it start though? Where did, I know you said obviously something led, led by HR, but where does it start in practical terms? How does, it, how, what does it look like? What it looks like is you can actually, you need to get the, senior leaders behind it to say actually we need to make sure that everybody in this organization who is a leader is actually leading effectively so it's about putting in place those critical core skills of time management prioritization delegation communication and giving feedback for all leaders at every level mm -hmm. that then gives them the capability at its most basic to manage tasks effectively and be in control of what's happening. Once they can do that, then it allows them to do those things on the list, like asking people for their opinion, building trust and transparency, because then they're in control of the situation rather than being diverted from doing that through firefighting. That's the fundamental step. That can be done so easily. So, a, get all your line managers covered with the most basic of task management skills. Then, if they are being inspired by the example from the senior leaders to do those things on a day-to-day -day basis, then naturally all of the things you're doing in HR will become more effective because the climate in the organization, the culture will have changed. It's about building this we, not me culture. This culture of I want to give my best because mm -hmm. I genuinely care. You see, the point about if people care, it doesn't just mean they perform well. It means they'll look after customers. It means they'll manage risk operationally. It means they'll look for opportunities to improve and to innovate as Go well. Go beyond their job, yeah. Go beyond their job because they genuinely care. Then if you flip that round onto other factors that come in, for example, if they care, they'll break down silos. The data would suggest the more you can break down silos in an organization, the greater the profitability. If they care and they've been told what the big picture is, they can then cut out that 25% of work that doesn't add to strategic deliverables and replace it with work that does. Those basic skills, for example, we know that the research says that the inability to manage time and prioritize means that most line managers underestimate how long jobs take by 30 to 40%. So naturally, from that moment onwards, everything is going to go off the rails. So it's about HR saying to the senior leaders, if you support us in this really simple set of actions, we could potentially get 10% on bottom line for no cost. You have to lead it. And these are the steps that we have to do. And probably if we start these steps of getting the basics in place, changing the culture and making people care, we will start to see benefits within three to six months. Mm -hmm. And that's something, as you said before, which is really important that they can do immediately. It's not something they need to <laughs> plan out. Uh, something they can, and this costs a huge uh, amount of investment. It's something that they can have an immediate change that will help the implementation and success of all these other projects, as you said, that they're focusing on, which is where all the attention is. 
um, at the moment as well. But, but the you... most, the most, the most basics uh, is that this list of this list of things that I alluded to about you know uh, the reason my boss inspires me is because they listen to me, they help me develop my career, they let me get on with it, they don't interfere, they build trust. I genuinely trust them uh, and transparency, and my boss is capable of doing a good job. On that list, I've said to chief executives, look, how simple is it? You just print that list off and you <laughs> give it to every single line manager in your organization and yeah. you say whatever you like. You say, do more of this. Assess yourself against how much of this you're doing. Mm -hmm. Ask your people how well they are, you know, you're doing on this. But the fundamental point is that no matter what your organization does, no matter where it does it in the world, you have human beings working for you who will respond positively to a boss who does the things on that list. And every boss knows what those things are because they want them from their boss. So it is so utterly simple that actually... It is to be blunt. It's a no-brainer. A finance director yeah. of a major, a finance director of a major global. It just takes someone actually to execute it right and to do it, <laughs> yes. uh, which, which is also underestimated. You need someone yeah, yeah, to yeah. really lead that change and push that and commit. They need to fully commit to it. You see, what is interesting is that when you present this in a in a structured way to uh, bottom line focus people, like I do with the Chartered Securities Institute in the city, with finance directors. They're blown away by this. Because, <laughs> They're used because, to signing off big projects. That's precisely. Why. <laughs> so, so this is, so this like, is wait a, a project. <laughs> this is a project. First of all, they don't believe me. Yeah. How, how can you possibly get up to 10% more on bottom line for no investment? Yeah, well, it's true. And, and, and when Time you, investment, right? It, exactly. When you take them through, um, well, yeah, or is it, you know, people say, oh, explaining the big picture is, is, is really complicated and time consuming. You say, what? People you, always look at the negative, don't they? Do you, do you not? <laughs> and this is another thing that comes up. Do, do you not have team meetings? Uh, no. Okay. So probably in terms of audiences I talk to, about, again, about 30% will have regular team meetings. The others won't. So I say, I tell you what, why don't you think about maybe having a team meeting once every couple of weeks in which you know you ask people how things are going you explain what's happening in the big picture and then you've a listen to them which will make them think that you know you're starting to care about them and b you've explained the big picture and i find it it, it, it hilarious that um i go to conferences and uh, and speak and people say but this co this communication stuff is really complicated chris and what i do is i produce a little green book and the little green book is entitled Team Briefing. Now, for those of, of your audience who are as aged as I am, they will remember a, an organization called the Industrial Society that has become the Work Foundation. And in 1975, note, 1975, they, that's 42 years ago, if my maths is correct, they produced a book explaining how to do team briefings very very simply with even with formats in where you just write in what you say now that was 42 years ago i would have thought that the hr profession and senior management could probably have at last after 42 years managed to get most teams to have team meetings that were two-way effective communication Sadly, it seems not to be the case. My question is, is it going to be another 42 years before we finally get a grip of the agenda that we know truly makes people inspired and want to give their best for the organization? Because from the HR perspective, that's what inspires me in mm. that if you have hundreds, if not thousands of people who are genuinely inspired to go to work and genuinely inspired when they are at work, they're naturally going to be giving their best. And the interesting thing is this isn't just about, you know, they will develop themselves to their full potential if they're in that environment. That's amazing. 
their teams will perform at their best. That's amazing. The organizations will be successful. That's amazing. And then in terms of economic growth, it means that in the wider economy, in our communities, and in our societies, then we have happy people who want to do their jobs existing in a society where everybody is content with what they're doing with their lives. And, and that's a fundamental, I believe, a fundamental human right. And that is the power of HR. It's not just about, oh, yeah, we can, we can put in a performance management system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can identify a few, a few high potentials. You know, let's be honest, and don't forget this point either. If your high potentials improve their performance by 10%, or you improve the performance of everybody else in the organization by 1%, no guesses for the final result as to which improvement adds most value to the organization. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, again, where we in HR sometimes have a tendency to drop into the trap of thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, we have to... You know, it's this special group of people. No, we are there, I believe, to deliver success through making sure that everybody who works in our organizations is truly inspired and motivated so they care. You know, in the end, people say to me, what, what are the critical things about why people give their best for organizations? And it boils down to a, a, a story that I um, sometimes tell. Uh, when I, uh, as an ex-army officer, when I left the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst after the end of the course, which as you can imagine was a slightly entertaining uh, six months of, of doing leadership and, and other military stuff, a very experienced uh, ex-sergeant major from the Scots Guard said to me and a colleague, he said, gentlemen, he said, don't forget this when you get to wherever you're going to and you stand up in front of your first group of soldiers every single one of them is going to have in their head two questions about you you need to be able to get them to answer yes very very quickly indeed the two questions are this one does he know what he's doing two do i trust him and he said if you get two yeses those soldiers will work hard for you, go through hell for you, and if necessary, die for you. Now, within the commercial context and the HR world, the latter, hopefully, is not necessary. <laughs> However, the fundamental question that we in HR never should forget is that every day somebody goes into work and they look their boss in the eyes, those two questions are being asked. Does this person know what they're doing and do I trust them? And if they don't get two yeses, particularly to the last one, then the chances of getting success in the organization are massively reduced and B, the chances of us in HR being able to achieve what we truly could achieve are also massively reduced. And I think going back to that level of basic simple principle about how we as human beings should interact we have to keep going back to in hr to understand how we can make the more complex things we do successful fantastic well chris thank you very much for sharing Pleasure. that honestly is very 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 insightful but also very practical that's what's fantastic about it a lot of times i have these conversations and you know it's, it's very thought-provoking which is what you said but also very actionable and something that our members can go back tomorrow and immediately start implementing an organization to have an impact and this is what this show is about really so thank you very much for sharing that. and also some of the great and great analogies as well to to to, for, to the context of it is fantastic as well um this kind of leads us quite nicely onto what we call the quick fire round chris yep. so uh we have a number of questions but you have no more than f 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers yep <laughs> are you ready go for it um what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a, a leader in the field of hr i think because i didn't appreciate necessarily those fundamental things i was 
mesmerized by the technicalities of doing HR stuff and putting things into <laughs> grids and three by three grids and boxes and data and all the rest of it, forgetting that actually all our core <laughs> data comes from subjective line managers who could be 25% out. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Best piece of business advice I think I've ever received was what that Sergeant Major said to me at Sandhurst. You have to be able to look people in the eye so that they know you know what you're doing and they trust you. Fantastic. Um, what's one book you'd recommend for our audience and why? I think uh, Nelson Mandela's autobiography, because if there's anything that's needed more of in the uh, commercial or business or leadership community, it's understanding those human drivers and understanding above all humility great um could you share one internet resource that you personally use to sort of increase your productivity or stay in tune with current events uh i i just think it's about scanning the bbc scanning google etc wherever i am in the world i always scan the bbc to see what's happening and mm -hmm. particularly to dive into what's happening i would just say to people don't think uk centric it's not about what's the best in your sector, what's the best in UK, what's the best uh, in the public sector or private sector. It's about what's the best. That's what you should be looking for. Great advice. I'm getting that more and more recently with the BBC as well, because it gives you, as you said, that, that global view rather than just sticking what's happening around you in the UK or in your own business. Um, could you uh, share, what's, oh, okay, this is a good question for you, I suppose. You know, what, what right now in your career most excites you? What are you most excited about? I'm just, I'm just utterly excited about working with groups of leaders, either delivering a big speech, and, and you, you can see the stuff I'm talking about, the penny dropping in people's heads. I know, saying, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, it's that it almost simple. Seems so, yeah, it does. That's, that's, that's what's quite, quite my mind. And, and, and it's, my God, for the last five years, I've been, <laughs> I've been missing the wood for the trees. It's that simple. But above all, I think, you know, it, it, it goes back to the, the ultimate keep it simple mm -hmm. that's what's going to work fantastic well look chris you've given us some great actionable advice and i'm pretty sure that our members will be a lot better off for it so thank you for that um give our listeners um one parting piece of guidance and also the best way for them to contact you i think you know it's about never forget that, that it might be called human resources but it's about human beings and in its final analysis, you know, I mean, people can get in touch with me via phone, via web, Twitter, LinkedIn. I don't care because I'm on this mission. Um, the army taught me that actually, if you get to the point where you have a group of people who believe more in we than they do in me, that you can achieve so much more than you ever thought possible and i've seen that work in commercial organizations where it's happened and organizations i've worked with for example one of them saw engagement scores uh, rocket from 40 percent to 80 percent in two years in terms of would i recommend this organization to friends or family as a great place to work so it's it's that it's that simple i think Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. Sure. Um, guys, make sure you head over to hrdleaders.com. There you'll find all of the show notes on the episode, everything we've been talking about, all the links. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and we're also on iTunes for the audio. Um, please rate and review. If you like it, great. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Chris, thank you again for sharing your journey yeah. with us. And um, I wish you all the best until we next week. Cheers. Thanks very much.